you very much for inviting me here. I am uh, delighted to have this opportunity to share with you the story about the transit of Venus. If you have questions, feel free to you know, type up as we go along, but you have to shout them out if you have a So the transit of Venus, it takes a little while to develop whole humor, that is entitled the transit of Venus from the 18th century. And the transit of Venus is going to happen on Tuesday, June 5, 2012, a little after 6.04 p.m. And it's going to be, Venus is just going to be a little tiny dot moving across the front of the sun. So I'll uh, go ahead and get underway here with uh, the pattern, first of all. So there are the transits of Venus from 2004. And transits will come in this strange pattern of there being two transits in eight years, and then a long span, and then there'll be two transits in an eight-year span, and then over a century, two transits, a jump like that. So how come we've got this strange pattern, last one in 04? Well, this is my idea of cutting edge science, is kind of cutting edge, you know, cutting paper plates and stuff like that. So uh, normally, Venus, when it's in conjunction with the Sun, appears either a little above or a little below the Sun. Because the orbit of it, Venus, inside the orbit of the Earth, is inclined somewhat to this orbit of the Earth. It's only about three degrees. So usually, when you're looking from the Earth towards the Sun, in this case, Venus will appear below the Sun, and then later in the year when Venus is up here, it will be above the Sun. Only when the two of them line up on this hinge here, this node, do you have a transit of Venus. And there was a transit of Venus when these things were lined up in 2004, <coughs> across the bottom of the Sun. In 2012, when across the top of the Sun. But by 2020, another eight years, Venus will be climbing up this incline here, and it will go across just over the top of the sun, and you won't see it. So we're going to follow this timeline of occurrences of the transit of Venus and the whole transit of Venus story. And uh, begin with 1639, and let's go back to a church. We're at the University of St. Francis. So let's head to England at St. Michael's Church, where young Jeremiah Horrocks, kid's only about 20 years old, and he does the math and realizes that, hey, Johannes Kepler missed it, but there's going to be a transit of Venus in 1639. He's only got a few weeks. He wants to tell a lot of people about it. So it's the day of the transit. He watches on Saturday because he didn't want to miss it, but it, it was going to occur on a Sunday. And he was a, a, a very spiritual person. And here's he, he's the first person in the world to see a transit of Venus. He's going to be able to determine the apparent size of this thing. He's going to be able to determine the, the orbit of the, refine the orbit of it. It's the only person who's ever had a chance to do it. But it was the sun. And for him, church was business of the highest importance, which for these ornamental pursuits, he could not with propriety neglect. you got to respect that. Church duties are done at three. He comes racing home. He looks and he sees the transit of Venus for the last 30 minutes before the sun sets. And so he, he recorded on the limb of the, on a, on a projection and he saw it at 3.30 in England and that time of the year, the end of the year, sun sets. But he back, he got it. So his church has since, uh, uh, here's a stained glass window in St. Michael's Church. Uh, Behold a most agreeable spectacle, it says down here. And uh, there was one other person, Lynn Crabtree, that he told about, depicted there, uh, who also witnessed it in 1639. So the church has honored him since then with all these stained glass windows. And one of them, uh, here you can read it, says uh, Venus and Solvisa. And this is a publication he wrote, and it was published posthumously. You know, he died a year later. It was, it was a terrific loss. For British astronomy. But in this book, he laments that he wanted to tell more people about it, but A, he didn't have enough time, and B, he had to compete with sports. <laughs> <laughs> he writes, I hope to be excused for not informing other of my friends of the expected phenomenon, but most of them care for little for trifles of this kind, preferring rather their hawks and their hounds. Those are the four folks that we are still competing with. <laughs> if we as a nation want to prosper, 
through math and science, then we as a nation need to embrace math and science and celebrate them. Celebrate them like we do some of these other things. So, uh, that's my subspeech there. So this is a story of a celebration. And it's going to be a celebration in June of 2012. And then how it comes along, he never saw this comet. He never saw a transit of Venus either. He didn't see a transit of Mercury. But how does the heavy math? And in that math, he realizes that if you have people that go around the globe and they know their exact location, latitude and longitude, and they time how long it takes Venus to go from the left edge of the sun to the right edge of the sun, you can mathematically quantify the size of the solar system. How many miles is it from the Earth to the sun? Wow. This is big. Because, so if you have two if you have people around the globe, or even in the, the, the idea of parallax, you know, if you hold your thumb out in front of you, and you close one eye, and you see something in the background, it's okay, you can do this if you want, nobody's going to notice. They've only got one eye open too. So, you blink your eyes back and forth, and you see a big jump. Okay, that's because, imagine your head is the Earth, and you've got two observers at your eyes, and Venus is out there in front of you, going back and forth. Now, if you put your thumb way out there, well, that'd be Mercury, and it doesn't jump as much, so that was a little harder for us to use scientifically. Two people, though, across the globe are going to see two different cores, like this. These would be the views of two different people. And then, if we know that that diameter of the sun is about half a, half a degree, we want to know what fraction of the sun is that angle right there, letter A. And so here's an example in 1761, the data was taken, and eight years later, uh, James Ferguson put it in the book. I'm going to zoom in on this portion right down here. Uh, am I blocking your view all the time? <laughs> yes. Okay, I'll stand a little bit more over here. Okay. So let's, uh, let's zoom in on this section right here to show you what's going on. So, i got to show you how to forward it. All right, so there is Venus. So less than the diameter of Venus, there's the line from Vancouver, which is modern-day Sumatra, and the line from London. So it's a very small difference in those two cores. Very challenging. So let's jump ahead to 1761, 1769. The next pair of transits, nations set up a fleet of explorers. They're going to go out and they're going to try to tie this from around the globe. And this is where the really great stories of the transit of Venus are. These are the stories that got me hooked on the subject. So we have, well, even before it came up, now it's all of a sudden countries are going to spend a lot of money. So people are paying attention. They're all excited. That distance from the sun to the earth is called the astronomical unit. The astronomical unit. Capital A, capital U, astronomical unit. It's the biggest number in all astronomy, and we don't even know how long it is. But that's what we're going to figure out with the transit. So 20 years before, 1742, here's the modern atlas that's showing up here, well down here first of all, the transit of Venus that talks about in 20 years from Nuremberg, you're going to be able to see the transit of Venus. And if you zoom in, there's that image from the upper left with Venus passing between the Sun and the Earth. So when it finally does come around, all these trips take off. And there's some great stories. There are observers uh, in the United States by 1761. Uh, this is a story of Schaff, who went 1761 to uh, Siberia. 1769, he went to the Baja Peninsula. So it might seem like the weather circumstances were better, but in the Baja Peninsula, almost everybody in the party died from an epidemical distemper. Uh, they had an epidemic went through. But here's the guy who got a look. This is a Jesuit priest named Father Hell. <laughs> Father Maximilian Hell. And he was the one who was accused of cheating. They thought he was falsifying. One person accused him of cheating thought Father Hell is falsifying his results. But it wasn't until many years later that somebody found out that his accuser was colorblind and was misinterpreting the smudge marks on his notes and stuff like that. So Father Hell was one of the colorful characters. He ended up getting back his good name. And then in 1769 also, right here, James Cook, Lieutenant James Cook. The first of his three major voyages as a captain, 
The first voice was Tahiti to Tahiti to witness the transit of the demons. Now with Cook, Keen, and with others, there's a problem here. We want to try how long it takes to go all the way across the edge of the sun, and it's a, a perfect black dot in silhouette. But when it gets to the edge, well, you notice there's like a like a ligament there. It, it stretches out or something like that. It, it won't let go of the edge. It's called the black drop effect. And it has plagued astronomers because as you're looking in your telescope, you're like, is it touching now or, or, or now? You know, and you can't get it to the second, according to Halley's method. And you can simulate this if you want. Just look at something really bright, bright light. Put your hand right in front of your eye and look at that bright light. And just before your fingers touch, you might notice that, hey, you know, it looks like they're touching before they're really touching. It's for a different reason, but if you just want to do that on June, June 5 and share that with others, uh, that simulates the, the black drop effect. All right, so let's press on to 1874 and 1882. Another century, another set of tools. Now we have photography. So the U.S. Naval Observatory thinks, let's send out all these explorers and try to photograph it. We can do better and eliminate that black drop effect thing. Here's the Indiana part of the story. In the expedition to Kirkland Island and Patagonia in 1874 and 1882, respectively, the assistant photographer was from Indiana, uh, Irvin Stanley. And, I mean, these are hardy folk. Uh, this is where they're staying in the Patagonia year. Isn't that pleasant? They're going to be here for months in Patagonia. And, and uh, Kerguelen is the most desolate place you can find. So I'm going to get back to that in just a second. But in that year, it was also getting to be very popular. For those of you in astronomy clubs, this is the advent of sidewalk astronomy. Only here, they're charging 10 cents to peak at the transit of Venus. In New York City, they had to have policemen keeping the line in control. And uh, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes even wrote a story about the transit of Venus, and he talks about the Galileo for the mall. His sidewalk astronomers were making a bundle of money with a lot of silver dimes on that particular day. Today we'll hear the tinkling chime of many ringing silver dime. Well, photography was a bust. They weren't. They didn't give us the numbers that we wanted to. It wasn't until we got radar that we got a really accurate distance to the sun. But photography did give us some more cool pictures that popularized the event. And so uh, this is also that lovely turbulent island, absolutely desolate. And they brought these photos home and put them in these stereo viewers. And, and this was the entertainment of the day, a stereo viewer. And of course, who wouldn't want the entire trans of the Vienna series? Uh, that should be in every collector's item. Uh, and you can see, you know, and, and if you have a stereo viewer, of course, you'd love to have all the images of the telescopes. And here they are practicing before the transit of Venus in Washington. So all these stations are heading out across the globe. They prefab them at the U uh, U.S. Naval Observatory. <coughs> and uh, more sites, these are the water casks. And, uh, and this is Urban Stan himself. And, of course, when you're... Uh, Explorer on a desolate island, you have to be wearing your trousers, your vest, your jacket, your tie, your top hat, and your pocket watch whenever you're hunting duck. But that was just the style of the day. And that's where they stay for months. Because not only is it transit, but just a moment. But they had to watch many lunations, many phases of the moon to get where the moon transited and all these stars. And we're going to have a whole exhibit on that in South Bend if anybody wants to come in the month of May. And, okay, another thing, if Transit of Venus was made popular from the pulpit, this sermon was written and given the night of the Transit of Venus having happened in the day and, uh, and the pastor. And he was talking about how Transit of Venus is, uh, reinforces our covenant with God because it's as sure as the motions of the planets are, so is the surety of God's covenant with us. Predicting a transit of Venus is easy. But for all of the prophets to predict everything that came to pass in Jesus' life, that was not an easy feat to do. 
And so the transit of Egypt is no feat compared to what was achieved in faith. If I was saying that right. The whole thing's not mine if anybody would like to read the 20 page text. It's all on the website. And you heard that music that opened it up. That music was John Philip Sousa's Transit of Venus March. I don't know if you knew that when it was played. Uh, he wrote a march, which was obviously Mitchell Sousa. He wrote a book 20 years later. Don't bother reading the book. <laughs> In the book, he's talking about all oh, these misogynists, the women hating men. They belong to the Alimony Club. We're going to go south to watch the Transit of Venus. They chartered a ship, no women allowed. And then the captain informs them that there's a stowaway. And the caption underneath the picture says, Gentlemen, my niece. <laughs> so. All right, now we're up to 2004-2012. The modern pair. 2004 now, there's much better literature out there. Uh, if you'd like to find some great resources, they are available. Uh, and also, back to the theme of how this all got so popular, and it was put into stamps. So this one just issued in uh, November as they celebrate the observations from Rodriguez Island. And here's a person, that, an artist, that made a stamp, a worldwide web stamp of 23 kilobytes is the uh, value of that one. In 2004, we also had all kinds of artwork. We're going to be having art this year. And this is a good thing to do with students. Science and art together. The Trans of Venus is a great opportunity. On that day, this is what you can expect. We had this is at 5:30 in the morning. We had hundreds of people show up, and you better have your scopes ready because they're cut up. And we had webcasts, and uh, you'll see these people are wearing solar shades that I'll talk about. New tool in the 21st century: satellites. For the first time, you can see it in satellites, which is really cool. So here is the view from the Trace SPAP satellite in different wavelengths. Now, who here saw the Trans of Venus in 2004? Very good. Good for you guys. Who here has never heard of Trans of Venus before today? You're the best. Go okay to it. That's okay. Thanks for doing Very good. Put your hand up. Free your park in Fort Wayne. Ah, thank you. So this is the view from 2004 taken by Larry Cripper. Clipper Gun. Larry. He got here. He got here. Okay, so here you can see. Venus, right here. So some of you thought, some of you never heard of it. Google had a feature called Zeitgeist, which would aggregate hundreds of millions of queries a day to take a pulse of what people are looking at, what's interesting to people. According to Google, this is just anecdotal, it's not scientific or anything like that, but according to Google, Venus transit. was the number one most popular event in the world for the entire month of June 2004. And it happened in the first week. And it had so much public interest that it carried to be the most popular event. Now, I want to really love to show Jeremiah Horrocks, if I could today, the guy who's lamenting the sport, is what did the trans of the beat out? U.S. Open, Wimbledon, NBA, and the European 2004 Championship. Beat them all. So quiet satisfaction. So this is 2012 then. Here we are in 2012. You're going to see it begin at about 6.04, when it just starts to creep into the sun here. And it'll take uh, 20 minutes or so to cross the limb until it's uh, right there. And you want to get that instant right there. You want to time that moment when that happens. Venus will move about halfway across the sun. Uh, it takes about six and a half, six hours and 40 minutes for the transit of Venus. So we'll see about half of it when the sun sets around 9.15 or so around here. And it's also, in time right now, you go out right now, you can, you can see the sun today. Uh, you can see it, there's a bunch of uh, sunspots on it. And this was just a little while ago, a few months ago. It's, a lot of sunspot activity is visible this time, so look for that as well. The cool thing about our new tools now is that not only is Venus historically significant, but the transit, of, the transit method is now the leading edge of astronomy. Because now, this is the Kepler mission. And we use what's called the transit method 
to find planets around distant stars. So this spacecraft is looking, if you can see the summer triangle here, Vega, Deneb, and Altair. So this is a big chunk of sky here. And that's the field of view, a very big field of view, just above the plane of the Milky Way here. And it is looking at 150,000 stars simultaneously. And as it looks at these stars, it's watching the brightness. And then every now and then, for just a few hours, a star will dim. And it goes back to its regular brightness. A few months will pass, and it dims again. A few months will pass, and then it dims again. What's happening? What's transit? A planet. Yeah, you've discovered a planet. The data is public, by the way, if you want to go searching for planets. So it's like if you were to go on top of a skyscraper in a major city, look at 150,000 streetlights that are miles away, and you're trying to detect the presence of a gnat flying in front of that distant streetlight by the amount of light down on that street. That's pretty cool. They've discovered over, they've confirmed over 60, and they've got thousands of candidates yet to be confirmed. And so what happens is here you've got a planet moving in front of the star, and as it crosses the star, the light starts to dip rapidly, and then while it's moving across the face, the light level is lower, and then it goes back up once it's off the star. So I know we've got some educators in the group. Here's just a simple educational thing you can do. Is you can see here's a planet transiting the star, and if these are photo cells that your detector is getting, just count time equals zero, time equals one, time equals two. On these 14 frames here, just count how many of your, of your photo cells or your receptors are receiving light. It'll give you a curve just like that. And this right here is real data from the Kepler mission. Another thing is staying with that stained glass window and honoring Jeremiah Horrocks. Um, we've got templates. And what people will do is they'll color in this round bell part and put their own words down here in the banner akin to that one. And if you actually if you see some of these up here, you know it's the adult section kind of get into it even more than the kids do sometimes. But here is the great fun of transit to be. This is kind of dangerous. We're going to be doing something we've been told all our lives we should never do. We're going to stare at the sun. But we've got to do it carefully. Now, folks, look. We don't want to have a nation of weenies who are afraid to go and look at the sun. We can do this, and we can do this safely. So let's. This is the time to go out and watch the solar system in motion. This is an elegant spectacle. So there are things that knock out all of, you know, the, the dangerous stuff never reaches down here. So there are techniques that we can use. The, here's how they used to do it. You used to get a piece of glass. Take it from that window right there. You have a candle flickering, really smoky, and you put that glass over the top, and you smoke the bottom of the glass. And then at some point when you were confident that it was good enough not to blind you, you would look at the sun. Now that's not the way to do it. By the way, that just sold last year at Christie's for $122,000. The transit of Venus. So they kind of got the message on smoke glass, and yet three of them are still staring at the sun. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a few ways to do it. First of all, is in advance, you're going to have to find some solo shades. You buy them one at a time, they cost a buck. Now you buy them a thousand at a time, they're about 45 cents. You can use projection methods, like sun spotters, which project that circular sun, and Venus will be very clear moving across on the projection. You may use a number 14, and I'm telling you right now, everybody see this number right here? 14. 14. You may use the number 14 welding hood. Not two number sevens. Nothing else but 14. But it's not even 14. Now there's filters that go on the front end of the telescope, not on the eyepiece, but on the big end. Those are white light filters. And then now we've got these modern telescopes, hydrogen alpha telescopes. Is your club, uh, anybody plug in a hydrogen alpha telescope? We got about half a dozen of them. Wow. Fabulous. We have one here in the planetarium and a sun spotter. And a sunspot. You guys are silent. 
Good for you. Uh, now here's a, a rear projection screen. This is just this little device I'll mention in a minute. Something like this is sticking your telescope eyepiece. There's the eyepiece right there. And it projects onto the screen on the top. And this was taken during the transit of Venus in 2004. There's Venus. And you can see some sunspots. The, the beauty of this thing is that you can have people in wheelchairs and binoculars or a crowd huddled around at that key instant so that not only the person at the telescope can enjoy the view. So all the instructions are online if you'd like to uh, build one yourself or do a little mini workshop or something like that at the club. And we have more telescopes and more satellites. This is the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Man, this is this thing awesome. Looking at the sun, it's going to be able to see the transit of Venus. It's going to be able to see the transit of Venus. I just got the email today. Um, I don't know, 35 minutes or something like that before first contact. Because it's going to see it out beyond the white light. And so, oh, it's going to be great. Uh, okay, so instead of sending explorers around the globe now, in 2012 to China, what we do is we have a phone app for both an Android and an iPhone. Got one on my phone right there. You can actually practice, if you want, timing it. This will slowly creep in and you hit the button and it'll tell you how long you did. But now what you do is you look at your ID so when you see the contact, you hit the button. It records the time. It's got your GPS latitude and longitude and sends that off to a global database. Then we see if we, with our modern tools, can do any better than these explorers who went around the globe. Free. Uh, for all of your events, make sure you get them on the Sun Earth Day. That's the Sun Earth Day is NASA's event around which they're building the Trans of Venus. Uh, this is where I and colleagues will be over here in the South Bend area. And then I'm going to show you a couple of the good websites, transdevenus.nl. Uh, in the Netherlands is Stephen Van Roop, and he does fabulous work at uh, his website. Uh, really good blog, and he just does great stuff. If you want images for any presentations you're going to give, you can go to Prezi and Google, or rather Prezi search, Trans of Venus, there are images available there that I've got. Uh, the website group is really nice. There's not a lot of chatter and junk on this group so far, so if you go to that particular group. And I put all the very good videos. There's a lot of junk on YouTube, but all the Trans of Venus videos if you go down here to YouTube user, youtube.com, the username is Transit Venus. So that kind of separates the chat from the week. Uh, here's my website. If you scroll down a little further down in here, will be some more recommended links. Uh, teachers and educators, go to the education drop down, and there will be teacher resources that will help you. Uh, how to do it safely, go to the, oh, this is old. There's another edition on eye safety that you can find also from that menu item. So what we're going to have is a bunch of events going on in our community. Uh, TROBE being the acronym for Transit of Venus. So that's our treasure is the TROBE. And uh, part of it's going to be having a treasure hunt going around town. We've got a bunch of artifacts. I'm uh, going to be watching it here, going to the lake to watch it from Warren Newton State Park. Uh, I'll mention Bent Harbor in a moment because that's where the brewery is. Uh, and I'm going to be at the lakefront watching the sunset. I just have got to be on the lakefront on June 12th. I've got to see this, this image ingrained in my head. So that's the view I would dearly like to see with Venus in transit. All right, then there's going to be a party afterwards. At the brewery, it's called the Literary, the News in Ale. Had the first sip of that. And then all around the uh, mezzanine is going to be art, an art exhibit on the Trans of Venus and the band playing. And instead of having a time capsule, in previous centuries they'd leave these messages to their predecessors, you know, the, not the predecessors, the people that are following them. Oh, the next time it happens, the flowers will be blooming in June, and blah, blah, blah. So instead of having a time capsule, we're going to have a time keg. We're going to fill it up with a seal and let the transit over. So, now there is black drop effect coffee uh, in Victorian pantry, also known as the stained glass window motif, uh, all recognizing the black drop effect, black drop effect coffee. 
We even have a place called Pizza Transit. It's going to be doing a transit of Venus pizza. Hot sausages and jalapeno peppers and all that. It's a celebration. Remember that. Well, uh, we're talking back to the YouTube View Boys um, about what has been going on lately. I think it was we talking about looking to the west. And you would have been able to see Jupiter and the moon and Jupiter since dropped down and Venus has now come up. Last night, it looked something like this. There was the crescent moon and then brilliant Venus. Venus is just sunny in the sky right now. You'll see it in the west. They didn't even get brighter. So imagine, imagine I'm Venus, all right? I'm, 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 I'm the sun. Okay, my hand is Venus. So Venus has come out from the back side. There's spectators on Earth. Venus has come out the back side out here. It's kind of hanging out there far, far out, high in the sky. And now it starts to come across. And it's going to get closer to you. So it's going to get bigger. And it's going to get brighter. And on June 5, boom, right across the finish line, right in front of the sun. So Venus is going to start showing phases. So look at Venus, and sure you can see it in the phase right now. But watch Venus as it turns into a thin crescent phase. And that is one of the like, four key sites that Galileo saw to confirm the heliocentric model. The only way Venus can have phases is if Venus is passing between us and the sun. So that's about to happen. All right, so I'm uh, Oh, you know what? I got this image up because if you can see the sun looking like this on May 20th, May 20th, it's a Sunday. The heavens declare the glory of God, and it's going to happen on Sunday, May 20th, when the moon is going to creep up and start an eclipse to see the whole thing. You want to be out, say, Arizona, California, New Mexico, or find a really great horizon and practice practice using your solar filters and your solar telescopes on May 20th. There's a video online, blah, blah, blah. And now we get to 2000, not 2000, but 2117 and 2125, the next pair. Now we're all fond of saying, you know, you're not going to see it until 2117. Well, if you stay around in most of the United States, you're not going to see that one. It's not going to be visible from here in 2117. It'll be visible here next. 2125. So uh, these are the four websites I was recommending. I, uh, I'll have them available for you later or I want to put them up. Uh, I wish you well on June 5. Be safe. Have fun. Celebrate the math and science behind us. Wonder. And then act. Do something about it. The glorious sight. Pass it on. That's it. Thank you. He's available for questions. I'll just let you do it.